Welcome back. Now, six years ago, hashtag Justice for Liz flooded our timelines on social media after news of a 16-year-old schoolgirl was gang raped in Busia. Liz, not her real name, was confined to a wheelchair after the ordeal. Now, the six young men accused of the heinous crime were given the punishment of cutting grass. There was a huge public outcry with many saying our justice system had failed Liz and many other male and female rape victims. Well, fast forward to this week when another female victim was brutally raped in Homa Bay, bringing to the fore once more how we as a society view sexual and gender-based violence and whether our justice system and existing laws are enough to who not only see offenders behind bars, but deter others from committing the crime. Tonight, we want to look at the myths that surround sexual and gender-based violence and how these misconceptions have acted as roadblocks in the journey to justice for victims. Let me introduce my guests really quickly as we get into the conversation. To my right is Dr. Kizi Shako. She's the head of clinical forensic medicine. To my left is Job Akuno, who is a psychologist and head of Men Engage Kenya Network. And last but not least is Naitore Nyamu, an SGBV lawyer. Thank you all for joining me. Um, I think we'll begin with Defining what rape is, uh, basically looking at the anatomy of rape for those who may not know, or understand, or have their own concepts on what it is. I'll begin with you, Dr. Shako. Uh, what is it? What constitutes rape? Before I get to the legal side of things, Naitore. Well, um, as a forensic uh, medical practitioner, we still need to understand the law within our jurisdiction yeah. because you know we, we have to know a bit of everything because um, it comes to play when it comes to um, like uh, creating reports compiling medical legal reports and everything so rape in Kenya um, is when there is forceful penetration and that penetration refers to the vagina right you know, when there's penetration of one genital into another and in reference to an adult someone who's over 18 mm. and with that means like when there's sexual uh, when this penetration involving one person's genitals into another without any consent and of course now consent goes into a whole other area right. uh, was the person sober were they drunk or not you know were they forced did they understand what was happening and all that yeah so that's what rape is basically and oftentimes uh, you know you'll find this especially when it comes to the investigative side of things uh, police officers will say there is no uh, injury so there was no rape, but I mean, from what you've seen and what you would describe as rape, what would you say? Do they have to be scratches or some contortions or anything like that? No, actually, most times there may not be injuries, um, especially when you're dealing with, pe with females, because yeah. most times it may, it may sound discriminatory, but most, most victims are females are female, right. and most perpetrators are males. Um, when we're dealing with females, especially after adolescence onwards into adulthood, it's, um, it, you know, you may not have injuries because of the body's natural responses to sexual stimulation mm -hmm. that may create lubrication and all that so that there may not be injuries. So we need to stop relying on presence of injuries to decide that this actually occurred, this incident actually occurred. And there's a lot of misunderstanding on certain, um, the dynamics yeah. of, of a sexual assault across all sectors in the community the medical space the pol um, police level very many people have this misconception that rape means you know someone bust into your house dragged you out or in a bush a stranger ties you down and, and hurts you and you have all these injuries a black eye that's that's not usually what happens right. it, it you know they, there doesn't have to be any physical signs at all but that doesn't mean that nothing happened right exactly yeah. and the fact that most victims the offender or defiler is known to them yes you know, it's not a complete stranger mm. um Nightori, when it comes to now litigating a, a case like a rape case um and just hearing what Dr. Shako has described, what would make it difficult in terms of maybe the gaps in evidence and whatnot? Absolutely. Um, Dr. Kizzi has actually defined rape, which is the unlawful mm -hmm. and intentional yeah. penetration for, uh, between one's genital organ and another person's genital organs. And um, the issue of consent, without, without a consent, and yeah. if there is right. consent, was it obtained under duress, intimidation of any kind, mm -hmm. or how was that consent obtained? Yeah. Now, in, in terms of litigation, those are the elements that a prosecutor will look at to, to ensure there is a, a conviction of a perpetrator. However, there exist so many gaps 
specifically when it comes to collection of evidence. Because first of all, there is no information. How do, when a person is raped, where do they run to? Right. At least we advise uh, victims of SGBV to at least get to a health facility within 72 hours. Ideally, that's what should happen, but more often than not, that, that does not happen. And the moment there is no sufficient, sufficient evidence, then that creates a big barrier in as far as access to justice is concerned. Right. Yes. And there's also this uh, blurry area where if it's involving two minors, for instance, uh, the burden falls on the boy many times uh, because there's no such thing as consensual sex between minors. So yes. what happens in those cases? The cases of defilement, how the Sexual Offences Act as, um, as defined it in Section 8 of the SOA is um, when there is a, an adult and um, a minor. However, um, later on in the section, there is the issue of where the two um, parties are below the age of 18. And that has created a myriad of problems for the ju judicial officers because they don't know how to deal with this. First of all, these are minors. And when you look at the elements of defilement, there is the issue of consent. Minors are not in a position to consent. They do not, they lack the legal capacity to consent. So I would not say that um, the boy is automatically labeled as the perpetrator, but more often than not, we've had many boys who have been sent to Boston institutions because of defilement. And that's where even as an organization, we feel there is a gap that needs to be addressed in the legal framework. Right. Because even the judicial officer are finding it quite difficult um, when cases of two um, minors come uh, to court as, uh, as one having uh, ha as one having defiled the other. However, we should also note that there are actually cases whereby minors do defile other minors. Yes. Wow, uh, Job, let me bring you in here and, and talk about victimization. Of course, most victims are women, uh, and most perpetrators being men. Uh, you deal a lot with sensitizing men on how they're socialized, how uh, you know they view sex with the opposite uh, with opposite gender. In your view, what needs to still be done to communicate in a more effective way to young men? And I'm assuming now first young men before we talk about them being victims, but how do you communicate with them first? Yeah, thanks, uh, Victoria. And I think just listening to the two perspectives advanced by uh, Naitori and uh, Dr. Kizzi is, you see, there's the, the medical, you know, way of looking at it. There's also the, the legal way of looking at it. But now coming to the community way of looking at it, I work for Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Mm -hmm. And you rightly pointed out a case like the one that uh, happened in Oma Bay, which is one of the counties where we work. And what, what you see is that, um, the, the, the focus in terms of um, prevention, you know, defense and everything has largely been done with the girls. So we focused uh, largely on the girls on how to prevent, you know, rape cases and, and such incidences without holding to account the boys and the men in terms of their responsibility in both prevention and also their accountability uh, when such cases occur. And I think the conversation now we are having is how then do we, one, um, you know, equip the boys as they grow up to understand that, you know, these are the do's and don'ts in terms of how they relate with the girls and, and the women largely. And two, is to then get to a point where we are saying that, that the boys get sensitized, that they can begin to be more reflective because if you look at the, the young man growing up in any village, they are very protective uh, uh, you know, around their sisters. Yeah. They won't want anyone to interfere with their sister, but they are okay doing, you know, um, uh, you know, violating the rights of others, other, other people's sisters or other people's daughters. So it is it's, it's to you know, create that awareness that as young men, they have a responsibility to protect their, their sisters looking at it from a sister perspective, then now taking responsibility in terms of what should I do and what is a healthy relationship? Because that's where they, don't, they, they yeah. miss the gap. Why do you think yeah. that disconnect actually happens? Like you're saying, you know, they'll protect their blood relative, but when it comes to anyone else, they don't see the need to do that. Why do you think that happens? And people have probably blamed it on entrenched chauvinism in our society and whatnot, but what could lead to that? Yeah, you see, generally, um, it's easy to look at the problem from the other peoples. 
-hmm. Today I was in an interesting conversation where the speaker said that, you know, parents are in perpetual denial that their children are capable of committing an evil. The same thing happens when it comes to us raising our own sons and our own children. We do not see them as potential rapists, potential violators. We see the other children of, 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 of some other parents. So that's why we're saying at the household level, the conversation ought to be that what is it that we're doing to raise a, a boy child that will be responsible today and the days to come. Right. And when we do that and start letting our boys know that at a very early age, then they grow into uh, men of honor in the society later on. And I think that's why uh, you can see, even in terms of the work that we do for HIV, mm -hmm. we know that if, 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 if there is sexual and gender-based violence, the risk of HIV transmission becomes higher among those girls and, and, and young women. And therefore, if we don't address those issues with the boys at that stage, then it means that we're also not addressing all the other health issues that, you know, Dr. Kizzi and others, uh, you know, the, we are talking about in terms of um, what we need to do. And, and Dr. Shako, let me bring you in on another issue, which is reporting. You know, rape, unlike other crimes, has emotional implications, physical, of course, and psychological. And, and most victims, for obvious reasons, don't want to report the case because uh, they don't want to be further victimized, uh, the shame that comes with and stigma, or they feel that someone will say, I'm just lying, and oftentimes <laughs> feel that I'll be entered into a process that I can't control, especially mm -hmm. when it gets to the court uh, system of all of this. In, in your view, how can we improve the reporting mechanisms? Uh, yeah, that's always a debatable issue. Um, first of all, we need to create awareness on, on the need to report. There are very many people who don't see the, you know, all, the, all those questions come up and they think, oh, it's okay, let me not report. But we need to create more awareness on why reporting is important. Um, then it has to be easier. It needs to be made more friendly, so to speak. Right now, it's, it's a bit intimidating. You, you know, you're told go to a police, a police station and tell them what happened and thinking, a police station, come on, isn't there something a bit mm. more friendly? So it needs to be a more friendly space. And, and then we need to also train our police officers on how specific, I think we should actually have a sex crimes unit or an STBV unit in, across um, in the police force so that they, they are adequately trained and equipped to the skills required to handle these victims because it's very traumatic for them to go and talk about this over again already mm -hmm. like you said there's a lot of stigma and humiliation um, and then that that in my view would go very well with having housing all the experts under one roof so that the victims don't have to go from the police station to the hospital then oh you need an OB number go back then they have to go back and forth and all that so if we have all the specialized personnel under one roof to manage all cases of assault including sexual assault this would go a long way in, in empowering the system improving on evidence collection and um, overall a fair judicial trial outcome and, and speaking of a, a fair judicial trial outcome mm -hmm. uh, Naitore what have you noticed in terms of the trends when it comes to rape cases now? Of course, we've had the Sexual Offences Act in place since 2006, I believe. Um, <coughs> has it yielded the fruits that it was intended to? Okay, just before I get to your question, let me advance um, um, a point that Jacob, a job rather, made that boys are more keen on protecting their sisters they feel because that there is that relationship so they'll protect their sister but when it comes to someone else they'd not do it and that's where the problem really lies because let's respect women and girls because they are women and girls would not need to have that relationship to mm -hmm. protect them yeah. this is a human being with rights that are protected mm -hmm. so i think once we have that uh, societal attitude in terms of how we treat women and girls not because we have a relationship with them but because they are human beings mm -hmm. with rights then we'll um go uh, further in as far as uh, protecting um, women and girls and ensuring that cases of sgbv go back in terms of the trial, the Sexual Offences Act, to be honest, is a very comprehensive act in as far as sexual offences uh, crimes are concerned. And we've received uh, numerous results in terms of convictions, in terms even of creation of awareness, and in terms even of the direction that, has, that have been um, issued by various uh, judicial officers or the judiciary. Now, the problem lies in the fact that in how a criminal justice system is, Yes, it's very adversarial in the sense that 
a criminal case until it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt you cannot convict and for you and, and, and for um, the, the, the judicial officer the judge or the magistrate to hand in a conviction they have to be that watertight evidence the prosecution has to prove that case and to be honest if there's no uh, beyond reasonable doubt then that case the, the perpetrator will go scot-free because even the perpetrator they they also have their rights um, the, the right to affairs through a fair trial. And therefore, for sexual and gender-based violence, violence, rather, it's a very complex uh, situation in the sense that if that evidence is not collected and the issues that Kizi is raising, if we do not um, have a system that's friendly for women and girls to report cases, then how will those girls um, access justice? So it's therefore very incumbent on the state in this Kenya, the state of Kenya, the government of Kenya, yeah. to ensure that we have systems that work for victims uh, of sexual and gender-based violence. And even furthermore, make sure that we have mechanisms that prevent and protect sexual and gender-based violence. And yeah. it was shifted, well, sex crimes were shifted from being seen as offenses against morality to now an offense okay, against the state. the state. Yes. Has that made a difference at all? I wouldn't say it's made a difference because it's a criminal state. So yeah. if there's a disturbance in the public order, in the tr tranquility of the mm -hmm. society, then it's seen as an offense against the state. For me, the fact that it's a criminal offense, uh, then that um, makes it um, more grave of a crime. And people might, it, it, it actually has worked as a deterrent factor to would-be perpetrators. But now what's really, um, the issue that we really need to address is first of all, a review of the Sexual Offenses Act. Mm -hmm. And also just making sure that the gaps that are there are addressed. And uh, that's one of the things that as an organization where I work for Equality Now that we are currently uh, addressing because we've seen um, almost 12 years later since Sexual Offenses Act came in, in, into place, what are the gaps and how do we address uh, the, the prevail, prevailing gaps? And Joe, let's talk about uh, a demographic which oftentimes are the accused, the boys. When they now, the, the, the script is flipped and they now are the victims, how do you deal with them? Of course, the psychological trauma that also comes with because you're supposed to maintain this macho man uh, kind of bravado. So if something like that happens to you, how are they to process something like this? And you being also a psychologist, how do you also walk them through that process? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. And um, it's true that boys and men are raised to be tough. So there's this gender box where they fit. And within that gender box, one, if you're experiencing a challenge, you're supposed to handle it as a man. Mm -hmm. So you're not supposed to tell somebody else, you're not supposed to report it, which means that um, eventually they bottle up a lot of things. And when they bottle up a lot of things, what do we see subsequently? We see them also becoming violent in, 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 in subsequent uh, stages of life. And ultimately, um, some of them, because of their failure to deal with the mental health issues come associated with that, then possibly we begin to see a lot of men you know, also experiencing issues to do with mental health uh, challenges. Now, by and large, I think what we need to do collectively as a society and all practitioners mm -hmm. is to ensure that even as we talk about uh, sexual and gender-based violence, we need to also make the boys aware that it is possible that they could actually experience violence and that they, they have mechanisms to report them just like any other victim that experiences violence and that way they are able to go through both the medical as well as the psychological uh, services that are available uh, to help address that. And because of you know, that, that gender box, probably it's, it's, it's a bit harder for the men to come out when uh, such incidences occur. But I think by encouraging and enlightening, uh, enlightening the, the, the boys and ultimately men, uh, we then provide an avenue for them to come out and address um, their issues appropriately. And just as we wrap up, I just want to get from each of you your take on where do we forward this conversation? Because uh, Liz was six years ago. Uh, we have the, uh, the young lady from Homer Bay that we're talking about today. And I know this is not, won't be the, be the last conversation that I have on rape in this studio, unfortunately. But how do we take this conversation forward to where we see more justice for victims? I'll start with you, Dr. Shako. Mm. 
Well, um, I'd just like to add something that I really try to, to get out there is that violence breeds violence. And so whenever we, when we see our society just crumbling under this violence, you know, it's like a menace. We need to stop, look back and think, okay, you know what, it seems to be increasing, so we need to stop it because what's happening is that all this violence against children is creating more violent adults. You have children who are dysfunctional and grow into violent adults because that is actually what happens because they suffer trauma and 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 they learn that being violent is just a social norm. That's the way it should be. That's the norm. So we have to stop this cycle if we're ever going to have a change. Secondly, we need to encourage people to report. But even if they report, it needs to reap some fruits. And so for me, the biggest thing that um, I think that we need to do is focus our energies on um, ensuring that the Sexual Offences Act is solid. So currently I'm on one of the boards that, mm -hmm. that is putting together more science, adding more science and beefing it up so that we can address these crime scenes, crime, crimes, crimes better, because um, a rape as a defilement case is actually a crime. It's a crime and the victim and the suspect are both parts of that crime, that crime scene. Mm. And we need to process those crime scenes properly. Um, like she said, perpetrators also have rights, suspects have rights. Remember that not all suspects are guilty, some are innocent, and so they have a right to a fair trial, just like everyone else. And so for me, um, having in increasing the number of experts out there, beefing up the scientific aspect of, of um, you know, the scientific um, evidence that will be used to determine the outcome of a case is where we need to be heading. Um, yeah, as opposed to what's happening right now. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I, I think I just want to advance the, the first um, point by Dr. Tari that, um, you know, we need to also look at the community um, aspects and largely reorient and create new norms. You see, if, if the norm is um, gender-based violence is okay, mm. we then need to engage in a way that um, there, there is already evidence that when, for example, young boys are taken through um, some training, mm. either as young men as partners or such trainings that address, you know, positive masculinity and the like, they become more protective of the, the, the girls and, and, and the, the women. And the, the first step would be that after sensitizing them, generally, when, for example, we say that most of the schoolgirls are impregnated by the border borders, the border borders have their associations, for example. Mm. If you sensitize the border border riders to a point where they then say, any, we, in our constitution, any of us who violates any schoolgirl, for example, we will hold you accountable as a group. Right. You see, when they put that pressure, now we are turning that mob into a positive change. They are now becoming the agents of change that will begin to hold each other accountable. And when you have examples of those men who are already coming out to champion such causes, then you, you, you magnify their behavior. You bring them forward to now share, you know, their experiences of, of how they are treating women, you know, differently, respectfully and the like, so that eventually we have a new norm. That way we will be able to address. And the second part to that is at least make the, the community aware that the, the, these are the, the areas that would constitute mm -hmm. rape or violence because sometimes when a norm um, you know, something that you, you say, this is the way we've always done it. We've married girls or, off early, we've done this. Then they, they assume that that's the, the way things ought to happen. So we must therefore challenge and confront some of those harmful uh, cultures and practices mm -hmm. that then uh, perpetuate um, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Okay, so there's not waiting for the law to bring order, but actually being proactive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And absolutely agree with him because sexual and gender based violence is entrenched in gender inequalities and mm. power imbalances. And if you do not change the societal norms and attitudes we, towards women and girls, then they'll continue raping and defiling. Like the Homa, Homa Bekes that we are speaking to, you will lay a girl, you, you defile her, and then you go ahead and even use razor blade to cut her private parts. I, I mean, at what point have we gotten to? to such animosity as a country and as a people that you feel absolutely nothing for another human being. 
sexual and gender-based violence is the most widespread and also tolerated human rights violation. I do not believe we are angry enough and even the state is not uh, very active in terms of ensuring that and, and saying that enough is enough, we cannot be having such, such a large majority of women and girls being uh, being violated and abused every now and then. It actually has become a burden on women and girls to protect themselves because they know something might happen to me, so what do I do? And, 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 and I mean this is um, something that ought to be done uh, by the state and just have mechanisms that can protect all of us. Finally, for me, we need to enhance our response to SDBB. There are so many players in as far as uh, protection, prevention of sexual and gender-based violence is concerned. We need to enhance that uh, more sexual support and response to sexual and gender-based violence. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shako, Job, and Naitore for coming in and demystifying a lot of the issues around rape, and sexual, and gender-based violence in this country. So it's clear from what all of you have said, uh, that in order to deal with this issue, it takes society to say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And society exactly. being you all here yes. and those watching to say that we need to put a stop to this by just the small things that we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. That does it for Citizen Weekend. I'll see you again tomorrow on Sunday Live. Have a good night.